The Israelis attack a nuclear reactor in Iraq and say they've destroyed it. The train disaster in India, which could be the world's worst, with thousands feared dead. As the civil servants widen their dispute, Britain's ambulance workers set their date for strike action. Roy Jenkins confirms that he does want to fight Warrington for the Social Democrats, and it's first blood to the Australian cricketers, winners of the three-match Prudential Trophy series. Good evening. The Israelis have attacked a nuclear reactor near Baghdad, the capital of Iraq, and say they've completely destroyed it. According to the Israelis, the plant was almost ready to go into operation and would have been used to make nuclear bombs. To reach their target, the Israeli phantoms had to fly 1,200 miles there and back over Arab territory to bomb the reactor at Al Tawit, 12 miles from Baghdad. The Israelis say they chose Sunday for the raid because the French technicians who operate the reactor would be taking the Christian Sabbath off. The Iraqis report that nine phantoms bombed the site. They don't say how much damage was done. Here's our Middle East correspondent, Keith Graves. The Iraqi reactor was due to become hot to start operating within the next few weeks, and that would have given Iraq the ability to produce an Hiroshima type of atom bomb within a year. A nuclear device in Iraq's hands would say the Israelis have created a danger to the existence of the state of Israel. Iraq's efforts to become the first Arab nation with a nuclear device have been dogged by trouble. Two years ago, the core of the reactor was sabotaged while it was awaiting shipment from France to Iraq. There's little doubt that Mossad, the Israeli Overseas Intelligence Agency, was responsible. Last year, the head of Iraq's nuclear program, an Egyptian-born nuclear physicist, was murdered in Paris. The Iraqis laid that at Israel's door. Last September, a week after Iraq and Iran went to war, unmarked phantom aircraft bombed and slightly damaged a nuclear installation just outside Baghdad. It was assumed then that the Iranians were responsible, but independent intelligence sources now suggest they were Israeli aircraft, and certainly Israel's concern, one military commander has described the threat of an Arab nuclear weapon as a sword of Damocles, seemed justified. After the September raid, Iraqi President Saddam Hussein said quite openly that he wanted to produce a device for use against Israel. Reaction to Israel's attack has been swift and predictably critical. The Russians are stirring it up by making much of the fact that the Israelis used American-made aircraft. And the French, who built the reactor in return for a guaranteed supply of Iraqi oil and orders for French arms, said it could only increase tension in the Middle East. A pretty obvious statement may be. But the concern of foreign governments is that by staging the operation at this time, when the Middle East is already on a knife edge because of the crisis between Israel and Syria, the Israelis have seriously increased the threat of another major Middle East conflict. Israeli Prime Minister Begin has also left himself open to the accusation that he's electioneering. He goes to the polls later this month. The Israelis, however, say they attacked now because once the reactor is operational, a bombing raid could have led to a disastrous radiation leakage. At the moment, only a small research reactor is operational. The Americans say they were not consulted in advance, and they've joined the condemnation of the raid. Very serious development and a source of utmost concern. We have no first-hand details of the attack or of the overall damage, including radiation, including casualties. Our initial estimate of potential radiation effects is that they would probably be minimal and limited to the immediate vicinity of the installation. As the Israelis claim the reactor is totally destroyed and the Iraqis have neither confirmed nor denied that claim, the nuclear threat to Israel, who has her own reactor at Demona in the Negev Desert, is not entirely removed. Pakistan has a well-advanced nuclear program financed by Libya and its volatile and unpredictable leader, Colonel Gaddafi. And that's an even more daunting prospect for Israel. Iraq's neighbor, Iran, with whom she's still nominally at war, is having her own troubles tonight, with the strongest threats yet by the Ayatollah Khomeini that he'll do to the president what he did to the Shah. His outburst followed rioting and shooting in Tehran. The Ayatollah threatened to remove the politicians who disagree with him if they continue to challenge the religious authority. He used the Persian idiom for getting rid of them. I'll cut everybody's hands off. President Bani Saad has retorted that there's a move to get rid of him and impose a dictatorship. This followed the banning of his own newspaper and five others because they were said to violate the basis of Islam. Earlier riots in Iran this year have also ended in shooting, the worst at a May Day rally. 
20,000 communists and socialists were attacked by Islamic fanatics and the army had to break up the fighting. The May Day riots ended with two dead and 400 injured. There's no indication yet of today's casualties. In India, there's still considerable confusion and mystery about a train crash in Bihar state at the weekend. Facts have been scarce because it happened in a remote area. But tonight it does seem that the accident could become the world's worst, and by a long way. In the past few hours, the death toll has been put as high as 3,000 by the deputy speaker of Bihar state and by the rural development minister who's been to the scene of the crash. Thousands of relatives were there too, hampering the rescue operation. Most are giving up hope, for the crash happened on Saturday night. The circumstances are not clear, but one report says the train braked to avoid a cow and was blown off a bridge by strong winds into a swollen river below. It's also uncertain how many people were on the train, but railway officials concede that it was very crowded. In India, trains often carry more passengers than they should. When the carriages are full, they ride in the corridors, on footboards and on the roofs as well. And this was the case on Saturday night in Bihar state. Like this train, the number of tickets sold bore no resemblance to the people it was carrying. Mrs Gandhi has ordered all available help to the scene. So far, 185 bodies have been recovered, but most of the carriages have yet to be lifted from the river. Until now, the worst recorded train crash was at Modan in France in 1917. But the loss of life there is now certain to be exceeded by the scale of the disaster now emerging in India. Here at home, the civil servants took their pay dispute into its 14th week with more selective strikes and demonstrations. They did so in the face of an apparent warning from their minister, Lord Soames, about the government's final offer of 7%. He was asked in the House of Lords how long it would remain open. His answer? The government will be considering this when considering what action the unions take from now. If it was a threat, it didn't impress Bill Kendall, one of the civil servants' leaders. He said... It's part of the government's attempt to undermine our action, and it won't succeed. Well, today, the unions stepped up their industrial action. Their targets, the sensitive area of the computers that pay out unemployment and child benefits, their aim, maximum administrative disruption. Gavin Hewitt reporting. The walkout by staff at computer centres, such as at Livingston in Scotland, is yet another attempt to intensify a strike which has so far left the government unmoved. The staff here operate computers which process unemployment benefits to an estimated 700,000 people in Scotland and the north of England. It will now be left to staff at local employment offices to complete the laborious task of writing out the cheques by hand. Similar action was taken at the Gyro Computer Centre in Reading. The union says that the recipients of child and unemployment benefits may experience minor delays, but the object of their action is to disrupt the administration of employment offices. Oh, to create maximum administrative disruption in the two departments concerned, the Department of Employment here and also the Department of Health and Social Security, but without affecting the claimants who will still be able to get unemployment benefit, old age pensions and so on. But some of the claimants for child benefits and unemployment benefits will be affected and they are the most disadvantaged in our society. Only those who are signing on for the first time, uh, their names won't be able to go onto the computer, but they'll be able to report to their social security office and get unemployment benefit pending the outcome of the dispute. There have been today a number of marches to express the union's disgust at the government's refusal to increase its offer of 7%. For the dispute, now in its 14th week, is entering a critical phase. The members of the nine civil service unions are being canvassed to support an all-out two-week strike. The risk for the union is that it may reveal that some of its members are losing their enthusiasm for more industrial action. Another group who want more than the government's offered, the ambulance men, have given notice of their first one-day strike. It'll be on June the 17th. Emergency calls will be answered. The ambulance men have been offered 6%. And another problem for the government, the performance of the pound. Its recent weakness against the dollar and other currencies has started to push up the cost of industry's raw materials. And this threatens renewed inflation in the shops. Raw material costs jumped more than 2% in May, taking the increase over a year to almost 13%. 
The increase in prices at the factory gate, wholesale prices, eased slightly. 10% up compared with 10.5% in April. Today, the pound recovered a little, closing up 1.4 cents on Friday's figure at $1.94. Gloomy figures from ICL, Britain's only major computer firm. The company's announced pre-tax losses for the six months to March of just under £34 million. That compares with a profit of more than £20 million for the same period in the previous year. And ICL's net loss amounts to more than £50 million. The figures come less than a week after the company said it would have to cut its workforce by more than 5,000. We have to have these redundancies in order to arrive at a cost platform that we think is viable for the future and will get ICL back to earning profits next year. We cannot afford uh, a general pay increase any more than we can afford a dividend for our shareholders. So we're asking everybody to grin and bear it for the moment and we hope very much they'll understand the severity of our position but our belief that if we do this, ICL's got a future and if we don't, it's a pretty gloomy one. Roy Jenkins has confirmed that he does want to be the Social Democrats' first parliamentary candidate. He'll see party workers at Warrington on Thursday and expects to be invited to stand in the by-election. Voters are now expected to go to the polls on July the 16th or 23rd. And Mr Jenkins' message tonight was, I'm ready for the challenge. It was a challenge, though, that his colleague Shirley Williams turned down because she was too busy. So Noah Lewis asked him, aren't you busy as well? Yes, I'm busy, but I think she's even busier than I am in her nationwide tour. No, I'm fairly busy, but she's even busier. And um, I also think that I've been out of British politics for some little time in a way that she hasn't been. And I therefore decided that it was right. If this was what was desired by the local Social Democrats, and it was, that one of our national leaders um, should be willing to fight this first by-election, uh, difficult though the seat is. At the last election, uh, there was a Labour majority of uh, 10,000 or so. Do you regard it still as a safe Labour seat? Well, it's certainly traditionally been a safe Labour seat, and actually the 10,000 majority is a bit bigger than it looks because it's a very small seat. So it is a very safe Labour seat. I'm not deceiving myself, and no wish to deceive anybody else, that it is one of the uh, more difficult seats in the, in the country for us to win. And if we could break through and win Warrington, we would be in a position in which we could win an overwhelming parliamentary majority in the country. So it's an intractable seat to fight, but I think it's a seat well worth fighting, and I shall fight it, um, if that's our decision on Thursday, with the utmost vigour and with a real hope of winning. Dennis Healy launched another attack today on his main contender for deputy leader of the Labour Party, Tony Benn. The subject was the Shadow Cabinet. And according to Mr Healy, Mr Benn's effectively accused colleagues of being a traitor to the movement. That, said Mr Healy, gets up my nose. He also claimed, in a speech in Brighton, that moderate, long-serving party members are in danger of being picked off one by one by opponents of parliamentary democracy. Abroad again, and the new tension in Poland... The Soviet Union has put out one of its strongest warnings to party bosses in Warsaw, demanding action to break what are called anti-socialist elements. And the reaction from Warsaw, our neighbours, said Deputy Prime Minister Rakowski, are running out of patience, and we feel we've now exhausted our capacity for compromise. He was speaking as Lech Wałęsa's Solidarity Union began talks with the government over selective two-hour strikes due to go ahead on Thursday. Here now is our Eastern Europe correspondent, Tim Sebastian. Poland tonight faces a fresh political crisis with the government being squeezed more tightly than ever by its allies and by the free trade unions. Moscow appears to have warned the party leader, Mr. Kania, that the time for making concessions is over. But Solidarity doesn't agree. It claims those responsible for violence in Bitgosh three months ago have still not been punished. And that's why strikes are threatened later this week. The incident was the first time blood had been shed since the upheavals began nearly a year ago. Dozens of police raided a conference hall, leaving several people badly injured. It brought the country close to a national general strike and almost certain catastrophe. This film, shot by the police, shows one of the delegates appealing to them to stay away, but it had no effect. The police did their duty and the Solidarity Union exploded in anger and bitterness throughout the country. It put back relations with the authorities by months. 
By itself, this dispute is no longer of great national importance, but its timing is highly significant. It comes just over a month before a crucial Congress of the Polish Communist Party, which could introduce the most drastic reforms ever seen in an East European state. So the atmosphere is extremely tense, and any incident, however small, could upset the country's fragile stability. The Poles may have survived many crises over the last year, but even the optimists don't believe that their luck will last indefinitely. Two American competitors in the transatlantic yacht race have been rescued after spending several hours in the Atlantic clinging to their overturned trimaran, the Bonifacio. A civilian airliner picked up radio signals from a rescue beacon which all the boats carry. The yacht was about 300 miles off Land's End in the Atlantic. Rescue services were alerted and a Greek tanker sailed to pick them up a short time ago. They'll be transferred later by helicopter to the Royal Navy's destroyer, Cardiff. The Bonifacio, a late American entry, was crewed by Philip Stegall and Tom Wiggins. Their 45-foot trimaran wasn't one of the most fancied yachts, but it was thought to be swift. The two men are said to be none the worse for their ordeal. They'd set off on Saturday with all the other entrants in bad weather conditions. Tonight's leader is French entry, the Jacques Riburel, but Robin Knox Johnson in Sea Falcon is second. British nuclear fuels have agreed to pay a total of £96,000 to the widows of two former employees and to a current employee who suffered ill health. It had been alleged that the illnesses of all three were caused by radiation at the windscale plant in Cumbria where they worked. The company continued to deny liability, saying experts can't agree whether radiation is to blame. But in an out-of-court settlement, £60,000 goes to the widow of a worker who died of leukaemia, 21,000 to the widow of a man who died of cancer, and the man still working for British nuclear fuels gets 15,000. Sussex police think a burglar was responsible for what's being called a callous and brutal double murder at the weekend when a middle-aged couple were shot dead at their home in the village of Oving near Chichester. They were retired naval officer Lieutenant Commander Gilbert Alder and his wife Anne. Tim Hurst reports. The couple were found shot after they'd visited the theatre on Saturday night. They'd lain dead on the first floor of the house for about 12 hours before the gardener reported a broken window and the police were called. The killer broke in through a ground floor window and was apparently robbing the house when he was disturbed. The dead man, Lieutenant Commander Gilbert Alder, was found dead at the top of the stairs. His wife, Anne, had been shot in bed. So far, the weapon, a shotgun, hasn't been found but the police believe the intruder was carrying a gun when he broke in. They say the murderer is a vicious and dangerous man. But the real viciousness of this comes out having shot the husband, for whatever reason, to then to go into the bedroom and brutally murder the wife is absolutely cold-blooded murder. There's nothing else we can describe it as. The deaths have stunned the village of Oving. The dead couple took an active part in the life of the community, and now everyone in the village is being questioned by the team of 35 detectives. More than 100 police are involved in the hunt for the killer of 14-year-old Marion Crofts, who was murdered near her home in Fleet on Saturday. As Nigel Farrell reports, she was on her way to a youth orchestra practice in Farnborough when she was attacked. Marion Crofts was raped and battered to death between 9 and 12 o'clock on Saturday morning. She'd been cycling the four miles from her home at Fleet to a music lesson in Farnborough. The attack happened in some woods beside a canal. Marion's body was found badly battered around the head and neck. Today, 120 policemen have been involved in the search for clues. Every driver on the road that runs just a few yards from the scene has been stopped and asked to help. The police have a huge task ahead of them. This is right in the middle of an army training base and already detectives have started interviewing more than a thousand soldiers who live locally. On top of that, there are hundreds of joggers and even golfers who use this area, as well as on Saturday, members of an historical society who are reenacting a civil war battle less than half a mile from here. This afternoon, Marion's father, Mr. Trevor Crofts, agreed to tell me of his feelings about his daughter's murder. I just don't understand, really. Still don't understand now. A young girl can go off in the middle of the morning and ride a bicycle and not come back. 
The two-month-old baby daughter of Prince and Princess Michael of Kent was christened in London today. Her full name is Lady Gabriella Marina Alexandra Ophelia Windsor. Ian Webster was at the service. The christening was held at St James's Palace, the country retreat of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. The new arrival, who's known as Ella by Princess Michael and her husband, is almost two months old now. She shares her birthday, April the 23rd, with Shakespeare, and one of her Christian names, Ophelia, comes straight out of Hamlet. Lady Gabriella's 18th in line to the throne, behind her brother Lord Frederick, who at the age of two couldn't quite make out what all the fuss was about. Ella was dressed in the royal christening robe, which dates back to Queen Victoria. But after the service, Princess Michael remarked on one not very royal part to her daughter's appearance, a punk hairstyle. Ian Botham is staying as captain of England, at least for the first of the six tests against Australia. The announcement was made tonight, shortly after England lost the Prudential Trophy Series to the tourists. At Headingley, the Australians beat England by 71 runs in the final and decisive game in the three-match competition. Our sports correspondent, Michael Blakey, reports on the day's play. After some poor fielding in the morning session, England's fielding after lunch produced some sensational results. The catch went to Gatting, and Hughes was out first ball. But Australia had already scored 173 for three. Alan Border went after Bob Willis in the search for quick runs and produced a difficult chance for Jackman. That was four down for 187. The backbone of Australia's total came from Graham Wood, who was voted man of the match and the series. Wood went on to make 108 when he too fell to another piece of superb fielding, this time from Jim Love. England needed 237 to win, but they began with a serious setback. Boycott them for four, and England were five for one. Gatting and Gooch put on 65, but when they'd gone, the wickets began to fall, and Trevor Chappell, the fifth-string bowler, took three for 31. Love had made only three. And Chappell took the wickets of Botham and Jackman. So unexpectedly, Australia took the Prudential Trophy for the first time, an easy victory by 71 runs, and suddenly the forthcoming Test Series against Australia looks a lot more difficult than it did last week. And finally, ornithologists in Northern Ireland are getting very excited about a pair of birds. They normally live in the Caribbean. They're rarely seen in the British Isles. But these two have just nested by Loch Erne in County Fermanagh. Our reporter Christopher Morris has been out bird-watching. When the uninvited new resident of Loch Erne flew in, the welcome wasn't exactly a friendly one. Distinctly hostile, in fact, with all those black-headed seagulls flapping around trying to chase off the greater flamingo. After all, they'd never seen this pink concord of the bird world in their midst before. And in any case, the flamingo was way off course, about 5,000 miles from his normal home in the sunshine of the Caribbean. Unperturbed, though, by Northern Ireland's wet, wintry weather, they're preparing for a rather special happy event soon, here on the shores of the loch. It's the first time that flamingos have been known to nest in the wild anywhere in the British Isles. And in about ten days' time, the egg should hatch, providing an historic moment indeed for Britain's ornithologists and for the exotic flamingo family of Loch Erne. And so to the main points of tonight's news again. The Israelis have attacked a nuclear reactor near the Iraqi capital, Baghdad. They say they've completely destroyed it. As many as 3,000 people are now thought to have died in India's weekend train disaster. And there are reports from Poland that the strikes planned for later this week are being called off after talks between the unions and the government. That's the news this evening. Good night.